Valley Sloth Project uh, has been in the news a little bit and some of you may have heard of it. It is a dig that's currently going on in the southwestern corner of our state. So, we can go ahead. so the Sloth Project, when we say sloth, what are we talking about? Um, we're talking about this guy. This is Rusty, uh, the life-size sloth reconstruction at the Museum of Natural History. So these animals lived here in Iowa during the Ice Age, the Pleistocene, um, over 10,000 years ago. And this guy is made of basically wood, styrofoam, and cow tail hairs because sloths went entirely extinct at the end of the Ice Age. We have no more of these guys left today. Um, keep going. These are their modern cousins. As you can see, very, very different. Um, small, hanging upside down, living in trees, but in some ways the same. Still having really, really weird bones that we'll, we'll see and talk about. Um, still primarily probably leaf eaters and still with really big claws. Um, so keep going. Okay, so when we're talking about these, these sloths as fossils, um, they have a very ancient history with American paleontology. This month, a couple hundred years ago, Thomas Jefferson actually gave the first paper on uh, vertebrate paleontology in our country on megalonics. So the sloth that we're talking about, megalonics jeffersoni, Jefferson sloth, um, you can see here, here are some of the bones that were brought to Thomas Jefferson by miners who had found these in a cave in West Virginia. Found them, brought them in, and he took one look and wrote a paper called A Memoir on the Discovery of Certain Bones of a Quadruped of the Clawed Kind. Now, Claude brought to his mind images of some kind of giant lion. And in this paper, he theorized that that's what these might belong to. But by about this time, in 1797, a couple of days after his paper was published, he was beginning to suspect that they might not belong to a lion, that they might, in fact, belong to something more like a sloth. Sloth bones were starting to be discovered all over the New World in South America and North America at the time. Um, and they looked very similar to some of the really big sloths that we had in South America. So sloths um, range all over. These are the four kinds of sloths that we find in North America. Uh, this is our sloth here, megalonyx, the big claw. But there are several different other kinds of sloths that were here. Um, most of them, we didn't have much evidence of them from Iowa. So this is the Paramylodon, the Harlan's ground sloth, which is a little stockier than our megalonyx, tended to live in drier places. And then you can see over there the little one, the Shasta ground sloth, which we have a lot more of in places like the La Brea tar pits. And then the really big one, the Arematheriums of Florida. So when we're talking about digging up these sloths, where are we talking about? This is a picture of the Tarkio Valley sloth site. You can see there's the river down in here. This is the Tarkio River um, that flows towards Missouri. And there is quite a steep bank to get down there. This is what we start out with for our digs. And we manage to get from a place that looks like this to this. So what are between those two steps? Looking at, you know, an average Iowa, kind of southwestern Iowa rural farm, river valley, to clean bones that we can lay out and place into a reconstructed skeleton. 
Well, the answer to that is lots and lots of staff, dedicated uh, project leaders, dedicated uh, museum and geoscience staff, and dedicated volunteers who have all come together to really make this project what it is. And the, none of this would have been possible without uh, this guy right here, Bob Athan and his wife Sonia and his two daughters. So they owned the, the land uh, that that site was sitting on, along with another family on the other side of the river bank. Now Bob was an avid uh, arrowhead and artifact hunter, so he would walk along the creek bed, just kind of looking to see what he would find. And one day, I think 2001, he was out, he was looking around in the creek bed, and he saw a piece of bone sticking up. We think it got washed out in probably the floods of 1993. So he started digging, and he actually dug up several different pieces of bone. He collected them, and he actually glued them back together himself, put them together, and he knew he had something. He found a leg bone that's probably about this big and this wide. He found a giant shoulder blade. It's probably as big as most people's entire torso. He took one look and knew that this was not from anything that is alive today. He knew it was special. His daughters, the first students to really pull in to the Cherokee Valley Sloth Project, were going back to school, and they brought the bones with them to show uh, Holmes Semkin, uh, Emeritus Geoscience Professor. Holmes went out and took a look and knew right away that this was a very important site. These bones are so rare, there are only a handful of sites out there with more than one bone from this animal. So this was an unprecedented opportunity to explore uh, the skeleton and the lives of these sloths. We predicted, I think it would take about two weeks to two months to dig everything up. And in 2003, we started digging. You can see here they came in. They've been very active participants throughout. They invited us on out, and we'll get started with the excavation. So these are the two families. Um, the other really cool thing about this project is all the bones that you see in the exhibits out there have actually been donated to the Paleontology Repository and the University uh, Museum. They believed very strongly from the start that students were the key movers and shakers of this project. They donated the bones on the condition that students be involved in every aspect, from digging to cleaning to research. And we have been trying to live up to that very generous gift ever since. All right, so how do you dig sloths? Well, you get very dirty and very wet. <laughs> and you have a lot of fun, but it is a lot of work. So this is a picture from our first dig. It was known as the hot dig. Um, you'll see here three people who are badly in need of a break. It was about 104 degrees, and you're down in a river valley with the sun beating down on you. And the conditions, as Holmes said, were rather surprising, considering that people came back for a second go around, um, but they found um, part of the palate, uh, bones from the wrists and feet, all kinds of things that encouraged us to come back for more. And come back they did. So this is a scene uh, from the, the fall after that, and you can see there's a big screen here. So we worked across the stream in little sections, finding bones, seeing where the bone led. And the thing you have to realize about these digs is this isn't a full-time dig where you go and you camp out until you're done. We have what we call the, the Minuteman concept, where the call goes out. We're having a soft dig this weekend. Anybody who's available, come on down. Everybody piles into vans or cars or whatever uh, transportation they can find and basically makes the the journey from Iowa City all the way over to Shenandoah, about five hours away. And here you can see we're screening. So it's a popular misconception that we always find bones in whole big chunks. 
most bones are actually pretty broken up and need to be uh, found in all the junk that you get, all the clay and all the water, and then carefully glued back together in a lab. So we went from working in the blazing heat to working in the freezing snow and ice. We knew that there were a lot of bones back into the stream bed, into the bank. And so Bob Ethan, the landowner, actually went out with a hand shovel and cut into the bank to prepare a big area. And a couple of very dedicated volunteers and the very dedicated uh, dog, Bonnie, I think is down there, came out to dig and recovered some really fantastic bones in the freezing cold thaw. <laughs> we kept digging into 2004. By then, we weren't entirely sure when this digging stuff was going to be over. One of the really interesting things that I think this dig shows is sometimes you find something really cool, but you can't go get it. We had to wait months to go back and get the pelvis that we'd found on the previous dig. So another thing added to the volunteers' awe is patience. There got to be a point where we dug about as far as we could um, in one direction. We're working, you can see, across this big stream bank. So we're working on the north side of the bank here, working back, back, back towards the Athens house. You can see that we're shoveling into these buckets and the stream is behind. Excavation, I learned, is a lot about engineering. We literally had to get permission to partially move the Tarkio River for this dig. And uh, we were fortunate enough to get a local backhoe company to help us with this. People in Shenandoah were a little upset that they would not dig basements so that they could go out and dig sloth bones on a week's notice. But they very joyfully uh, kind of tolerated that. The Shenandoah folks have been great. This is a picture of the map. We started up here and worked slowly across the site. Now the first cluster of bones were found right in the stream which runs right through here and we worked as far as we could to the north and then we paused for a while in about 2005 because by that point there were a lot of pieces to put back together. So excavation is a huge phase of the project and when most people think of paleontology they think of people going out in the field. But what a lot of people don't realize is that for every hour you're out in the field there are 10, 20 or more hours worth of lab work to be done. And this is where a lot of volunteers were really, really helpful. You can see here's a volunteer putting together pieces of the shattered shoulder blade from the adult sloth. The more we took the bones out of their clay, the more we explored, the more we realized that there were a lot of unknowns. We went from things like this, which you can just see looks pretty much just like a chunk of clay, to a claw emerging, thanks to hours of work by volunteers. Now, some of these volunteers um, are familiar to those of us who have been working with the project. Um, this is Aaron Last, who started volunteering with us probably in elementary school. And he just graduated from high school last year and is actually still working with the project and the museum and has been instrumental in a lot of sloth project initiatives. I put him on here especially because this is the main volunteer who trained me when I came to volunteer at the museum. And of course, our director of operations also helped out. Um, this is Shala, who's helping to clean. And I also like this picture because you can really see what it takes to get from the site to the skeleton. This is all hard clay that is surrounding the bones. Because when you dig, you have to take it all out in one chunk. Otherwise, it'd fall apart. So after hours of work, carefully teasing apart all the bones, we started to get more of a finished product. And the Kopi, this is actually um, his wife. I think they might have even met on this project. So it's kind of a cool story pulling in a lot of different people. This has pulled together a lot of people and created friendships and uh, professional partnerships that have been influential in a lot of people's lives.
So this is my beginning with the Sloth Project, was piecing together all these things we had, sitting in the lab and hearing fantastic stories of excavations in the snow and in the heat, and really being excited to go out there myself someday. And I got my chance in April. So in April, we went back to the site. In the winter, they had been digging into the bank, and now they were ready to come across the stream and see what lay to the south. And I am in my orange shirt, hidden back behind there. I had no idea what to expect. I was a pre-med student who was maybe thinking about doing archaeology as a profession and digging professionally, but had no idea what I was in for. On the way out to the site, I was very excited, and what I found was that excavation is 30% engineering and 70% hard labor. We spent most of the first day uh, building a little levee and repairing that from uh, when they had left it before and bailing the water out of the site. But the reward was priceless. Um, we split up into groups probing for bones, sticking uh, long metal rods basically down into the clay, tapping, waiting to hear that tink, tink, tink that meant we'd found something. And about 10 feet away from where I was very diligently working, we heard this. And what we uncovered, it's really hard to see, but you can kind of see this maroon color and the outline along here. We uncovered it, we went and we got Holmes and our other uh, co-PI on the project, Dave, and showed them this. And they took one look at it and they said, I think that's a baby sloth. We all didn't know what to think. They didn't know what to think. Nobody had ever found a baby sloth with an adult before. But we went on to find both shoulder blades of this baby, several ribs, and a few of the vertebrae. And this was just the beginning. We kept going, kept digging. Now, the other thing you have to know about paleontology is that even when you're very excited and very motivated to get out there and find those bones, Mother Nature sometimes disrupts your plans. Um, in May of that year, the following month, we went out, excited to find more bone, but were surprised by a sudden thunderstorm. In the thunder and lightning, we tried to build a levee to protect the bones. And this also began the very long tradition of my becoming stuck in an attempt to haul a very large log down the stream to shore up the site and protect the sloth bones. This also led to the conclusion that, or maybe I should say the, the guess, that maybe our sloths got stuck in the mud and that this might be how they perished because they almost lost me this way. Surprisingly, we still started, kept coming back. Um, here you can see the same kid I showed you earlier. There's Aaron and Alex Brick, who's now at the University of, or Penn State University. In June, we found more and more of the babies. And then, just when we thought our luck couldn't get any better, we found another one, another sloth. No one could believe it. A fifth shoulder blade. And the digs continued. We were so excited. This has never happened anywhere in the world. We carefully removed the bones and brought them back to the lab for more work. So with three sloths and a site full of evidence of small animals like frogs and turtles, clams, all this information, we found that it's great to have all that, but it raises more questions almost than answers. And every answer we get raises another question. We were finding bones, and it was a mystery. How old are they? You can see this bumpy stuff. This is usually what it looks like when a bone isn't finished growing. When your bone's not finished growing? Well, when you're young. So for a while we thought, hmm, could this be a teenage sloth? Then we learned that adult bones in sloths, especially the backbone here, the vertebrae, keep growing. 
throughout a lot of the sloth's life. We also had some really small bones that we were really puzzled about at first. We later found that those belonged to our baby. Another mystery is whether this sloth, this big adult sloth, was a male or a female. It's sometimes hard to tell when all you've got is bones. A lot of people look at teeth and at the size of an animal. Big animals tend to usually in mammals be the males. They used to have, usually have really big teeth and are a lot larger than the females. Our sloth happens to be the second biggest of its kind ever found. And it has huge teeth, as you can see out in the exhibits out there. Is it a male or a female? Well, we guessed male. But then we started finding juveniles, babies. That raises more questions. Is this a male that was looking after children? It's not too common in nature, but it can happen. Is this part of a, a herd, so like a teenage older sloth who's uh, kind of just hanging out with the kids? Or is this a mother and her children? We're still trying to find ways to figure this out. And one of the most popular misconceptions we've had with this project is when one thing looks like another. So we found this bone in the middle of the stream, between where most of the adult bones were clustered and where a lot of the juvenile bones tended to be clustered. And our guess was that this was the heel bone of the adult sloth. They have these really weird heel bones that stick out. And we thought, oh, this part's just a little broken. But it's obviously a heel bone. When we had Greg McDonald, the world around uh, sloth researcher here in 2009, took a look at that and said, wait a minute. I think that's from the baby. I think that's part of the baby's pelvis, part of its hip bone. Come to find out, we aren't the only ones who've made this mistake. Think, uh, I talked a little bit about the Harlan's ground sloth, the guy who discovered that, made the same mistake, only the opposite. He found uh, a calcaneum, the heel bone, and said, oh, this is a pelvis. So we felt a little better about that, knowing that Harlan made the exact same mistake back in the 1800s. And then probably one of the biggest surprises for this project. We found this bone, um, or should I say Bob found it, on a gravel bar, but in the same area. And we thought it belonged to our adult sloth. It looked a little different in preservation, but it fit in with all the other bones. And that's when we found that it wasn't from our adult at all. It was from a paramylodon. These sloths had never before been found in Iowa. They'd been found in Nebraska. They'd been found all around Iowa, but never in Iowa. There was no proof that these animals used to call Iowa home until now. It's very exciting, not only do we have a bone, but we have one of the coolest bones. This is pretty much the pinky finger side. It's part of the hand on the pinky finger side, and it pretty much takes the entire weight of these sloths. They're very strange. They kind of walk like a karate chop action figure. And we happen to have that bone that supported all their weight. But that just brought up more questions. Answers, questions. You can see. We think that they might have actually been living here earlier, when the climate might have been a little different, but we're not sure. That is something that we're still working on researching today. When we look at that, we think, well, what was Iowa like back then? How do we know? We've had some great research done by geoscience professors looking at seeds, fossil seeds, and fossil pollen. And the picture that these things paint is a picture not that much different from the Iowa of today. Plants like oak and trees like oak and pine, plants like cattails and verbena. So this site is really unique in that it lets us get an idea of what the whole Ice Age was like here in Iowa, the Ice Age landscape that these sloths inhabited. So with all these questions, we have to have some people who are looking for the answers. And a lot of these people have been students and volunteers. Alex Brick is an Iowa City native. He'd been working at the museum, uh, volunteering since he was a little kid. And when he went to Penn State University, he wanted to stay involved with the Sloth Project. Alex is getting ready to complete his undergraduate honors thesis on the sloth teeth, exploring their structure 
and what they can tell us about the sloth's diet and environment. So here he is in our lab here at the University of Iowa slicing the teeth. So they embed them in this plastic kind of epoxy stuff and then cut them in half to look at a cross section. And that has told them a great deal about how sloth teeth work. Sloths are very strange. They don't have teeth like we do. We have solid teeth made of enamel. Our adult teeth grow in and then we're done. Sloths, however, don't have baby teeth. They have the same teeth throughout their life that just keep growing and growing. They keep growing up from the bottom so that as they wear down, chewing on tough plants like twigs and leaves and stuff, that they keep growing up from the bottom. And they're made of layers of stuff called dentine, which is what makes up the inside of our teeth. Now, there have been some people who study natural history who thinks that th this means sloths are evolutionary misfits, that it's impossible that they, it should be impossible that they've survived this long. And yet, research is showing, looking at the structure of these teeth, that in fact, it's a very good adaptation for keeping to live even beyond the age of most animals. Most animals, if their teeth are worn down, they can't get food. You can't get food. You are very quickly either starved or caught by a predator because you get diseases. Sloths don't have this problem. This might mean that they could get very, very old. And that can tell us a lot about the lifespan and lifestyle of these animals. We've got a lot of other researchers, some uh, out of the country, Andy Clack at the Center for Ancient DNA up at McMaster University in Canada is actually doing our DNA testing. So we have a lot of people who ask, how do you know your sloths are related? What are you doing with, with science, with radiocarbon dating? And we are having the Center for Ancient DNA, which is one of the best places in North America, um, take a look at some of our really thick bones and search for protein hidden in these bones, because you need protein to find DNA. And Andy's been trying very valiantly to search for DNA in these samples. He keeps sending us reports, but we are still waiting on the results. And just recently, we were very lucky, we have uh, Justine Hart, who is working in the Department of Geoscience. And her goal is to study how these sloths grow. We've never found a family together before. This is letting us do some really cool research because we can take a look at these three shoulder blades from the adult here in green to the toddler here in red to the infant here in blue and we can see how they're changing with age. The infant's probably only about one year old. The toddler's probably you know, around two. We don't know how old the adult is. Taking a look at how these things grow over time gives us an idea of what sloth families were like and of how these animals grew and changed. And she's doing it with state-of-the-art equipment like this microscribe, mapping points and seeing how they morph and change throughout the lives of these animals. So throughout this project, We've gotten very dirty. We've had a lot of fun, and we've learned that nothing is as simple as it seems. Although sometimes the questions can look pretty muddy with a lot of patience and guidance and help from a very varied uh, selection of volunteers, we have managed to make this project probably one of the best studied sloth projects in the world. I'd like to thank everybody for coming today. The site itself is on private property. Um, so a lot of people ask, can we go out and look at this site? I don't know if they're thinking of sites like the Ashfall Park or the Mammoth Hot Springs where there's still things left in the ground. but. When you just go out there, it's pretty much just a riverbed.
Definitely. I mean, we had everybody from Boy Scout troops that would come down to the Take a Kid Outdoors program to local Shenandoah. The, the city of Shenandoah really has rallied around this. We've been to their historical museum, given presentations there, and there are almost always lots of Shenandoah natives who actually come out and dig with us. And so everybody, I think that's one of the cool things about this project is everybody feels like they own a little piece of it. I know I sometimes joke that the toddlers, because I've been so, on so many of the, the digs with the toddler and the infant, they're my babies. It has really created a sense of kind of community and ownership. So I think all the volunteers who've worked on this project would say that they look at it and really feel like they've been a part of something. And I think that is something that's very unique. Most times it's one bone that's been washed out of a bank into a cave because caves kind of collect stuff. They're little nice little holes for stuff to fall into. And so a lot of times it's just a single claw, a single tooth. Um, and it's almost never found in the ground where it probably died. Um, these bones, we have about 60% of the adult. We have the big stuff and the little stuff. So it's very likely that these animals died on this very spot and were buried here. That means their entire world is buried around them like a big time capsule. So that also gives us an amazing opportunity to kind of take a look at all the factors here. And the family is just unprecedented. It's nothing like we could have imagined. Uh, sloths in the wild today, even though they're separated by you know, about 30 million years of evolution, they're all we have. These sloths today, they have one kid at a time. They kick that kid out of the nest. Then they have another. It's just the females taking care of the babies. We always thought that that must be the way giant sloths did it. And we had no no evidence, no, nothing to use to construct our ideas of what a sloth family would be like until now. There are a lot of unanswered questions when it comes to how these animals died. Um, there are no real obvious gnaw marks from like a large predator. Um, there, all the really meaty adult bones are pretty much still there. We're missing a lot of the, the toddler and the juvenile, but we don't know if they were carried off by water or maybe carried off by like scavengers. We have a lot of theories right now on what might have happened to these, but it's hard to tell when all you have is bone. Our exhibit planning uh, started when we just had the adult and if you've ever been to Iowa Hall, you'll know that we don't have a lot of space <laughs> free right now. So we had hoped to have a CSI exhibit in the corner across from our big sloth reconstruction. Um, and then we ended up with 126 adult bones and about 40 some bones from the toddler and the baby. So now we're not entirely sure what we're gonna do, but I think plans are moving forward for uh, the CSI exhibit, we're hoping to eventually get those on display in that corner to not only show bones, but also all the environmental research that's being done. So we didn't find a lot of other big animals, but we found some really fantastic little stuff. We found fingernail clams, uh, very tiny clams, and then we found really huge mussels. Ah, uh, large shells at the site. This tells us more about where these sloths uh, died and were buried. You see mussels and clams, and you can guess, ah, uh, this is kind of a more marine environment. And I think the consensus is that it was probably a very calm water area, like an oxbow or a pond. Because shells, little shelled things, can tell you quite a bit about the environment, they live in very specific places. They need very specific temperatures. They're very finicky.
there are a lot of clues, and a lot of that is research that we're hoping to do in the future, um, but we're working on right now. So we take a look at the teeth. That's the first thing you do when you try and figure out what an animal's eating. Are they big, sharp, pointy, you know, to your ex meat eater teeth, or are they flat? Sloth teeth, if you look at them, they're pretty flat on top. Um, they're very well adapted for what we call browsing, so eating leaves, twigs, um, stuff like that. And we actually are hoping to find these little things called phytoliths, uh, which are produced by plants. They're part of the structure of plants, little silica things that hold the plants up. And they get caught in teeth. Archaeologists love to use this because uh, as people chew, stuff gets stuck in their teeth. You're not brushing your teeth. You've got all these basically little tiny plant grains stuck in there. And these little grains, these little phytoliths, are unique to the kinds of plants that you're eating. So corn will produce one type of phytolith. An oak tree will produce a different kind of phytolith. And you can look at these under really high magnification and say, ah, that's from this plant. That's from this plant. It's the same for our sloths. So we brought our teeth over to uh, the scanning electron microscope microscopy lab and are actually looking at the stuff caught in our sloth's teeth, trying to figure out what it might have been eating. Uh, we're also taking a look at what's inside the teeth because all these plants have different kinds of elements in them, um, different combinations of different little things, basically. Um, and you can take a look at samples from these teeth, grind them up, put them through a machine, and study the, the ratios of this stuff and basically find out, was it eating more grass? Was it eating more leaves from trees? So we can use uh, a science called stable isotope analysis. But we probably had things like uh, dire wolves, regular wolves, uh, maybe some like saber-toothed cats, short-faced bears, so other very large predators, but also a lot of scavengers. I don't think there are too many animals that would want to try to eat an adult giant sloth, but the babies probably looked pretty tasty if mom was looking the other way. So we actually have a wound in one of our baby's ribs um, that might have been from one of those large predators that tried to, to catch it, but our baby got away. <laughs>